This is uh, session two of uh, the beginner astrophotography program. Last week uh, was the kickoff session. So I'm not gonna really do a review of that. You have the, the I think I sent out the links for folks to review the material or for those who, who didn't make the session. Um, but um, I'm gonna be touching on and building upon what we learned last time. Um, and then uh, from there, um, like I said, just it's open for question and answer and things like that. So this particular session is going to uh, we're going to get into different modes or different types of nightscape photography. Uh, we're going to talk about star trails, wide field, uh, DS, uh, deep sky region and Milky Way. In the future sessions, we're going to get into more details of techniques and things like that. We're just going to touch upon this and I'm going to review and cover off more details from some of the materials that we talked off, uh, we touched upon last week. So uh, last week we talked a bit about location um, and planning your uh, photography session before you go out to a specific location. Um, tonight I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about Bortle, the Bortle scale, and what you can expect to see. Uh, at different board levels and what I would be recommending to you if you want to photograph certain kinds of targets. Uh, so the border scale is made up of uh, one to nine. Um, eight and nine being can't see a whole heck of a lot. This would be the Mississauga and Toronto area. So you're still only seeing a few stars Clearly that kind of location in terms of photography is gonna live at you quite a lot. Um, for at least uh, the camera and tripod, yes, you can use filters and there's other techniques, but we're not going through that in this course. So I would probably, unless you're photographing a constellation or something like that, or maybe, um, I don't know, the moon or some planets, you're probably going to be limited to those types of objects in an eight and nine sky. Um, really, I think what you need to be targeting is on is the four or five. When you have a border sky of four to five, which is around mid range, um, then you're looking at being able to acquire more images and get better data. The thing with light pollution is uh, it not only uh, creates a real challenge in terms of contrast and capturing images, but it also, in effect, really lowers your, your signal to noise. So with photography, signal to noise is everything. So you want to maximize your signal and lower your noise. And there's a lot of factors that impact your noise, but light pollution is clearly uh, one of those that are going to factor into the noise component in a big way and make it very difficult for you to process out later on. You'll get gradients and all kinds of things happening. So my recommendation in terms of being able to cover off uh, shots like a little bit of the Milky Way, maybe deep sky regions and even star trails, I would, I would look at a four to five. If you can get down to a three or two, you're golden, but you're gonna have to travel a great, uh, quite a distance to get those kinds of uh, uh, portals. There is a, a website that you can go to. Um, you just Google light pollution map and it will come up. The first hit is a light pollution map of the world. And you can actually zero in in your region and it will tell you the portal scale, which is a good tool uh, for planning your outing. So for example, if you want to target portal two, three skies, you're going to be looking in at least two, two and a half, three hours away. And some good areas are, um, you know, uh, the um, uh, Lawrence Barron's site, Dark Sky site. Um, also the um, Tobamori in that peninsula area there. There's some parks that are actually uh, Boral 2. Skies are excellent for photography. But you don't have to go that far. You can get some three and 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 even four sites uh, towards you know some areas around Lake Erie and uh, upwards north about a couple hours. You're going to get portal four skies, and that's really something that uh, I think you would target at. But use that tool. 
uh, the light pollution map, and it'll it'll uh, allow you to zero. And I use it quite often when I'm doing any kind of road trip. I've got a, a trip booked to uh, Manitoulin mm. for uh, June, and that's Bortle uh, Two, where we'll be. And uh, I've got another trip booked in uh, July at Bacchus Heritage Park, which is a great place to photograph. That's Bortle Four, but you can still get really good results there. And that's, you know, several hours closer in terms of travel distance. Um, so in terms of exposures and, and taking your shots, um, again, if you're looking at something beyond 30 seconds to a minute or two minutes per exposure, um, your limit in a 30 second range is about five, six. Um, but Bortle four, you can get up to three minutes without any significant uh, light, light pollution bothering your image. So that's why I'm saying if you can target the four, even four or five, I think you're, you're doing pretty good. The other thing you need to consider is your view of the sky and what objects you're going to be uh, taking a photograph of. Clearly, if it's a Milky Way, you need a, a horizon towards the south for many of us, and uh, you need to stake that out using um, Street View, uh, the, um, the map programs. Uh, there's various map programs with satellite views that are high resolution. Uh, will help somewhat, but it doesn't really give you a 3D view. So you need to either get reports or do a site survey uh, to pick your location. And sometimes you just got to wing it and see what you've got. Um, taking word of mouth from others. The one thing we tried to do in a club a couple of years ago, I don't know how successful we were, was we were going to have uh, a database built of uh, viewing locations and photography locations within an hour uh, of the GTA and build a database and have attributes for that location, you know, border levels and things like that. I don't know if anything came of that. There were some few recommendations, but it seems to me a, a project that would be of interest, especially for those who are getting started in astrophotography. Yeah, that, that was a great idea. That was Joe's uh, initiative. Yes. It just sort of died on the vine. He he had the, uh, um, he still has the um, light pollution uh, light meter. Um, but um, it, it's a great idea. So if someone wants to pick it up or I, I think we'll if you're traveling, you can borrow it. I, yeah, I think you're right now. Actually, I think Joe's been sending out messages to individuals about sites he's been selecting and things like that, but it may be something we can talk about at a future meeting just to see if we can pick up that initiative. It, you know, it, it requires some discipline and work, but boy, is it ever helpful. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Good. yeah. Because it's, it's not easy finding sites to, to photograph from for one or reason or other, there's always something. Um, the other thing we were just talking about is night security. Um, being somewhere where you're safe. Uh, I, I know, you know, many of us used to go to Forks of the Credit until they kind of shut that down. Um, those kinds of places, you had some form of sense of security because you were, although you wrote in public setting, you know, there was usually other people around uh, and you had that. But if you're in the middle of nowhere and it's pitch black and there's nobody else around you, it can be a little bit unnerving, especially if there are critters in, around, right? And and I've been in that situation and it's, it can, you know, you, you can get um, really enticed by the, the clarity of the sky. But having that night security, uh, you know, being with other people is something that is uh, you need to consider. Uh, just having a presence of mind of where you are physically and location wise, um, sometimes it's better to be, I know you're gonna have a little bit of light pollution, but it's better to be close to some kind of civilization um, in case something goes wrong. So you know that's part of the site selection clothing we talked a bit about that last week you dress for the conditions and then a few degrees lower because as you sit outside and you're taking photographs which could take a couple hours or more you're going to get cold uh, you're going to feel the cold more especially if there's dew in the air uh then of course there's things like insects you know i i mean right being up in the muskoka for years photographing um, as uh, dusk approaches, we just get eaten alive. So you know you gotta you gotta be protected that way. And then of course too, 
right? So dew is going to uh, be present, always present. So there are, we'll talk a bit more about that later on. Any questions on this chart? Okay, moving on. Okay, we talked last time about uh, DSLRs and modifying, um, you know, for full spectrum. I'm not going to go through that again. We talked at length about that. Same thing with the intervalometer. Um, the power source, we touched upon that as well. Um, I think you want to look at what it is you're powering and you may want to do a calculation. So um, some power sources allow you to calculate the full wattage of your consumption of your equipment. And then if you take the watts per hour of that power source and divide it by the uh, wattage, you get the idea of how long your equipment will happily last with the power source you have. And then add 20% because as the temperature drops, the efficiency of the battery drops. So um, just when you're sourcing, there's a lot of good power sources out there, battery power sources now that are online, but you, you need to look at what your requirements are in capacity. Um, wide field lenses, we talked a bit about that last week. And so this is a bit of a review, uh, solid mounts of tripod with good uh, head mounts. Um, if you're doing Milky Way, um, and we're gonna get into that in more detail, you need a good quality star tracker. So this is just a bit of a review. Any, any questions on that? And, and when it comes to lenses, by the way, um, I'd be looking at anything around two to four for your focal ratio and uh, just give you fast enough optics to work with. Otherwise, something beyond that, because you're going to have to stop your lens down. Anything beyond that is going to take you a lot longer to photograph. So I would try to stick to it. It's going to be more expensive, but I would I would try to stick to those fast optics. Okay, um, focusing. So this is a uh, probably one of the most challenging areas with regards to astrophotography. When you're doing terrestrial photography and you have a stable image, it's relatively, it's not... For, for animal photography and things that are moving, it's really difficult, but typically you have depth of field, you have techniques for focusing. It's relatively easy to focus on a terrestrial object. When it comes to a star um, or the moon surface or uh, solar activity or, or whatever, all of a sudden it becomes a, a lot more difficult. Um, stars, for example, now, most DSLRs and uh, astro cameras, for that matter, have magnification capabilities that allow you to bring a star into view, magnify it 10 times, and do a fine focus. In a lot of cases, it's not sufficient enough. Uh, if you try that and take a photograph, say a five-second photograph of Starfield, and zoom in, you're going to notice your, your stars are out of focus. It's really... And in every lens is different. Some actually move focus point when you touch it ever so slightly. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about issues with certain kinds of lenses and what to look for. But one of the things that normally is uh, something you can really count on is a batten off mask. And they're cheap. Uh, you can order them online. And they have some now that allow you to adapt a batten off mask for uh, ranges of objective lenses, so different sizes. When using a batten off mask, you can see this picture at the bottom here. What you do is you go to a bright star and you will get a pattern that you see down here in the bottom left. And what you're going to do is you'll probably see a view like this here where the X is. that uh, You do not have um, a proper convergence of those three lines. Uh, one may be skewed in either direction. So what you're going to do is slowly adjust the focus. And it takes practice. But adjust the focus until you have a clean convergence of those three lines. Well, once you've done that, uh, 
be very careful. You remove the mask and you should be in precise focus. So, and it, it, it does do a good job. So um, the thing about before when I talked about pressing the magnification button, the process of actually flipping your viewfinder, touching those buttons sometimes throws the camera off the field of view or the focus. So having something like this makes it a lot, there a lot less guesswork and, and works very well. Um, the other thing you're gonna have to keep in mind is that typically you're not gonna be able to photograph wide open. So if your lens is set to, if you have a 1.8 wide angle lens, you can afford to go down a couple of F stops and have no problem. Um, but you're you're probably not gonna be able to shoot wide open because at the edge of the fields, you're going to get coma. You're gonna get star distortions. Um, and what will happen is you'll end up having to crop your image. So to avoid that, you probably have to stop your... There are some lenses that work fantastic wide open. They're quite expensive but they are out there. They use special glass and, and uh, something to be looked after. Let's see if I, any questions on this chart? I know there's uh, quite a bit to digest and it's really something you have to practice. Um, I'm gonna go back here for a minute and, and um, I don't know if I got into it later on, but if you can see this lens here, uh, this um, one on the uh, bottom right, it's a, a wide angle lens. I think it's actually 50 millimeter or 17 millimeter. Um, those wide angle lenses are really hard to focus. They're, I find them a lot harder to focus those lenses than um, a um, higher magnification lenses like a 200 or 100. The reason is because they have a Many of them have this focusing ring at the top and they're notoriously slippery. They go out of focus very easily. And also, if you're using the magnification method to focus, you're hardly magnifying that image. So when you actually go take a, a shot of something and you zoom in, chances are that star is going to be to focus. So you pretty well have to use a batten off mask. And, and even then, you have to choose the right star. So a little bit trickier. People think it's really easy to shoot wide field, but it's, it's a challenge to get that focus just right. Okay, batteries. We talked a bit about this before, um, but you want to look at a battery that gives you uh, many options in terms of uh, power output, AC and DC um, with coaxial, USB, uh, USB-C, and then your standard uh, the VAC output with the uh, three prong plug for the ground. Um, and something that can handle dew heaters. So typically in the 10 to 20 amp hour range is good for, if you're gonna use camera and, and uh, lens and even a star tracker, that'll have, and dew heaters, it will happily power that all night long without without problem. So you, you wanna have some, uh, uh, you wanna have a capacity that's gonna last you the whole night that you don't need to have to charge. Uh, that's, a, that's an important piece. And there's a lot of batteries out there uh, on the market that will do that. Some of them very lightweight, not these car batteries that we used to hang up. Remember those days in, in Starcraft, we had car batteries that we have to haul out and things like that. We didn't have power right in the fields. And, and that was, people would put their hair dryers on there and no more battery power left. It was awful. Things are a lot better now, a lot easier. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, we talked a bit about this last time, apps. Um, so um, we get into more of the um, some of the polar alignment apps. We talked about clear outside, uh, astrospheric, spelled it right this time, and uh, clear is clear outside. This is a view of those apps. So they're free. I recommend you go and try them out. I'm not going to get into the operation of those ones. They're pretty self-explanatory, but they're very valuable in terms of planning your routing. And then uh, Polariscope Align Pro, which is an app I use by Optron, but it'll support pretty well any mount. Um, it will really help you if you have a polar alignment scope on your, um, your tripod or your Star Trek, whether it'll really, really help you dial in your um, 
uh, your polar alignment. And once you have good polar alignment, you're going to have good tracking, relatively good tracking, and you're going to end up with much better images. So um, that app, I think, is about, it's gone up in price. I think it's like six or seven bucks now, but it's well worth it. And it's got a lot of other features. It's got a lot, bunch of databases, and it'll give you coordinates. Um, the Polar Scope Align Pro has a mode. Sorry, question? Uh, the Polar Scope Align Pro, um, it has a feature in there, which is which is kind of neat. And it's a deep sky object feature. And what it does is if you mount your, your, um, your, your phone or whatever device you're using with the app loaded on your OTA or your, your lens, there's a way to mount them. Uh, and I can show you a little later on how to do that. It has a go-to feature. So in other words, uh, you polar align your scope first, you set it up just right. It will take you to a nearby star. So you make sure that you're aligned to that star and then you can go to an object within, you know, 15, 20 degrees of that uh, star and it'll dial it in for you without having to invest in a go-to mount and it works very well. So there's some really cool nifty features on this particular app, um, which I like. I use this at the star parties as well, the, the observation star parties, when somebody says they wanna go see something and I can't quite find it because it's light polluted, I'll use something like this and it works quite well. Any questions on this? Okay, so now we're gonna get into the actual various techniques of taking um, pictures uh, of different objects or different techniques. So the first one is star trails. Uh, probably one of the probably one of the simplest um, uh, types of astrophotography to do, but you know it still can be challenging. First is setting your location. So you you want to go to a location, as I said before. Um, Star trails are best done um, unless you're trying to get some really interesting foreground objects. But even the one at the bottom here with the Joshua tree in the foreground, which is beautiful. And that was, that was taken over a uh, four hour period, four or five hour period. So you need to be somewhere where you're talking about at least Bortle four skies. And even a Bortle four skies, the sky is gonna look bright. It's going to come up bright, but you're going to have some really interesting effects. Anything more than that, a lot of these stars are going to get washed out. It's just not going to work out well for you. So site selection is really important for star trails. Just photographing a star trail is the way to start just to get used to it. But when you start incorporating foreground images like barns, trees, uh, not hippopotamuses, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but, you know, something of interest that you can actually uh, photograph and even light up a bit with a campfire or something like that is really good. Um, or, uh, you know, some kind of mountain scenery in the background or whatever. So in order to do that, you know, you obviously you attach your DLSR to your tripod. I use a quick release mount. Uh, attach your intervalometer and your battery and dew heater. Um, I would recommend that you have not internal batteries with your camera, but a battery that I showed you early. I would stay away completely from internal batteries of camera. After 10 minutes, the battery is going to die and you're toast. So you really need to have a, a, a portable battery and dew heater for your lens. Definitely. Um, you start with, um, you know, sending your lens to infinity, but my preference would be to go and find a star and do a batten off mask focus uh, first and lock, if you can lock the focus on your on your lens. Um, if you can do that, some people use tape. Um, there's other techniques, which I'll talk about later on, but you wanna lock that focus in. Um, then you want to, again, you presumably you planned your image, you have a foreground object, or you're gonna point, um, you can offset um, Polaris, so you're going to be predominantly pointing at Polaris to get a circular view of stars. If you want um, to trail stars, but you don't want a center, like a, 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 a center focus on Polaris, you can do that. You need some planning, 
but by and large, you're going to be closely located to, to Polaris, at least for the first few times in, in pointing your object. So you want to plan it such that you've got an object that is in your foreground, or even before you get to that point, just point it at Polaris. It's the easiest way to get started. And then you want to set your intervalometer uh, to take a photograph. I would start with about a 30 minute exposure um, on your settings. And that's why I'm saying you need to be in, you need to be in the Bortle four skies or even less, because if you go beyond that, you're going to start running into a lot of problems with light pollution. Uh, yes, you can do star trails shorter, but you're not going to see much result. The thing about star trails is that it's the exposure length, right? And um, and taking multiple subs and stacking them isn't going to work because you're not going to get star trails. So the only thing you're going to do is open up your camera, put it in bulb mode, in more in 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 manual mode. You have your intervalometer set up to take a 30 minute exposure. That would start with that, and then you know that you should have a a, a decent result. So I don't know how many of you have tried this technique. Um, it takes a little bit of practice, but you know, focus is key. Uh, having a foreground object is great uh, because it really makes the the uh, the photograph interesting. And I've seen some excellent photography of star trails that are just stunning, uh, with you know, being a little bit creative. Any questions on that? Has anybody done uh, star trail photography? Comments by anybody? No? No, one, one comment actually. Um, like in the picture down below, you said about 30 minutes, but I just from looking at it, uh, it looks like some of the stars are longer than 30 minutes. Would that be yeah. a longer exposure? Okay, yeah, just wondered. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This one at the bottom is four hours. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's a four hour a, exposure. <clears throat> there is a way apparently to stack star trails. I've never done it, yeah. but. Um, there is a way to sort of put there them is. together to make a longer trail. <laughs> yep. In fact, it's a technique they use with comets as well. Oh, okay. Right. So it's a similar technique and I've, I've, it, it's takes a little bit of effort, but um, you know, because with comets, if you want to show a path of the comet, if you stack those comic images, it's going to bring it all to one point, right? It's a similar <laughs> technique you use with star trail. So there's a way to do that. If you think you need to have like take five minute exposures and stack about you know 30 of them or 40 of them or something like that it can be done okay yeah. okay yeah. Yeah, it's... i'm not going to get into this course but there is a way to do that and uh um you know it's something we can if you if you're interested and you want to pursue that you can ask me a question offline and i'll give you some information on that all right thanks any other questions on that cool okay so now with um nighttime landscape milky way um the thing about Milky Way um, is that you're going to be requiring different equipment or additional equipment. Um, there is a way to do Milky Way photography without a tracking mount, but I, I don't think I'd, I'd probably advise against it because you're probably not going to get great results uh, unless you want to have star trails. <laughs> So, um, like some people do that, they want to have like a smeared Milky Way image. There's there's different techniques and things like that, but that's not what I'm talking about here. So you're going to need to look at some kind of way to compensate for rotation of the Earth with a, with a tracking mount. Um, uh, some of the mounts, the, the mount I use is an Ioptron Sky Guider Pro, but there's many different mounts out there. Sky Watcher has a family of mounts. Um, there, there, there's so many, there's even some now that are, that are battery operated that last pretty well the whole night and are very lightweight and they're meant for wide field astrophotography. Um, and they're very inexpensive. Um, I have never used them, but there are several now in the marketplace and, uh, you, you know, you could try with something like that and probably get decent results. Um, keeping in mind that once you start getting into tracking mounts, then you also start to, you have a requirement for some kind of polar alignment. And that's why I brought up the Polar Scope Align Pro previously. It's a, it's a very good app. Most of these tracking mounts have, um, will have a polar scope. And the reason for that is that you need to use that polar scope to polar align. Uh, and most of them, ones with polar scopes will have a reticle and the reticle will be 
uh, will look something like this. And therefore, this is meant to be, it's fairly universal, this app. And then what you do essentially is uh, with Polar Scope Align Pro, and that's, there are other apps as well, but it's the one I use, but there are, there are other apps. It will pick up your uh, GPS coordinates from your phone. It will plot where you need to have Polaris positioned on that reticle. And all you do is you adjust your mount with the Altaz adjustments. Most tracking mounts will have those. If they don't, it's a useless tracking mount. Don't use it. You will then adjust the alt as until the polar Polaris is aligned. You can see in here, there's a little dot aligned there. Lock things down, and it's remarkably good and accurate. Uh, once I've done that, I've never had issues with star trails, even at 200 milliliter or 200 millimeter, 300 millimeter lens for five minutes, which is quite remarkable. Again, it depends on the accuracy or mount too. You need to have a decent tracking mount. Uh, it wouldn't cheap out. But like I said, there are some lightweight mounts there on there now. You want to make get a mount that has the ability to have alt as for sure. It can handle about five pounds. You 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 want to look at that, and you'll want to have something that, that needs to come with the polar scope. If it doesn't have those features on it, I would stay away from the tracking mount. It's not. It's going to be aggravation for you. Uh, filters don't need them. Um, you're going to be photographing Milky Way in Bortle three, four skies. Probably getting to five, you're going to have some challenges with, with light pollution. It can be done, but three, four is really recommended. Um, again, you'll have to focus the camera, as previously mentioned, with a batten off mask or as best you can. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into all the, uh, you know, you have, you have to set up your star tracker such that you're setting up at the right, your, at the, for your right location. You may need counterweights depending on the kind of tracker you have. You may have to have counterweights. If you can't balance your star tracker with your lens and camera, in other words, like if it's tilting too much to one direction or the other, um, you may need to add counterweights to your, your tracking mount. Some will allow you to do that. Uh, if you're going to get into uh, anything beyond, you know, 200 millimeters for a lens and your camera, you're probably looking at some kind of counterweight necessary. Um, and then we talked about the use of the app uh, on there and adjusting the altos until you match Polaris. Uh, I say Bortle 2, 3 Skies recommended that probably you might be able to get away you probably can get away with four portal sky four but best results are going to be uh are, are going to be with two and three and again if you can get a site like at a, a national park or something like that it's ideal because you have some kind of foreground object or background like foreground object being the mountains or a lake or some kind of building um that's going to make this uh really interesting i mean i've seen uh, I've seen photography, Milky Way photography done in, in some locations in some national parks where you have glacier lakes and someone's actually gone to the trouble of putting lights, um, blue lights or yellow lights at the edge of the lake um, at different positions. And it has a way of over the night um, illuminating the whole lake. And because you're tracking on the Milky Way and say you're doing a 30 minute shot or a 20 minute shot, the, the effect is astounding. And so little things like that, you're going to learn techniques and things like that. I've used um, little, little red flashlights. I did a Milky Way shot with when I had my kids writing with sparklers in the sky and they were doing it for several minutes at a time off in the distance. And it was kind of kind of it was just an experiment. But it turned out pretty cool. So there, there's a there's there's it's almost limitless the kinds of things that you can incorporate into your Milky Way uh, shots. And again, this comes down with with your planning on what your effect is. When you're first doing this, you know, choose a flat landscape. Don't worry about foreground objects. Just get your technique down. Uh, take some shots. But getting to a dark sky is going to be fundamental. Number one, um, and 
tracking and getting the right focus. You can take Milky Way shots. I would stick to, um, you know, focal lengths, probably 35 millimeter, millimeters and less. More like 17 or 18 is really good. 20, 20, 26, no more than that. Once you start getting too tight on the Milky Way, then tracking becomes more of an issue. And then it's, you're getting close to deep sky region photography versus the, the Milky Way itself, if you want to, if, if that's what you're going for, right? So I would stick to focal ratios around or focal lengths around, you know, between 17 and, you know, 25 or something around there. Uh, I think you, you, you're, good, you're good with that. So even less, some people have done fisheye lenses with Milky Way. That's more of an all sky view. You get different effects. Any questions on that? Let me know if I'm going through this stuff too fast. I can, we got some time here. Um, so now you're ready to take your Milky Way shot. Um, you've got it set up. Um, What's going to happen is you're going to move your camera. Uh, uh, if it's a tracking mount, you're going to have your camera uh, on an RN deck and you're going to move your camera in a certain direction to face the Milky Way. But guess what? You're now, your camera is out of a square from the Milky Way itself. So you're going to probably you're you're going to probably end up having to rotate your camera to get the framing that you want. So it's not just a simple matter of pointing at the Milky Way and shooting because what you're going to get is the Milky Way off kilter and out of the frame. So you have to rotate your camera such that you've got the right frame. Um, and that's why I'm saying you start with no foreground object to begin with. Just focus on getting the Milky Way. You can see the shot down below. That's my photo. You can see that shot there uh, is framed off a of center slightly, but it's going, you know, the proper angle. Um, if it was pointing straight up or off like this or even flat like that, you, you just got to make sure that you're rotating the camera. If you And that's another reason to have uh, a certain kind of mount that you have the freedom to rotate your camera without having to. And again, you got to make sure that you're not touching the focus. One of the one of the issues with that is in framing and moving your camera is that you touch your focus and you got to start all over again. And I've done that so many times. So um, they're got to find a way to try to not touch that lens. Just use the camera if you can uh, and set up the the do the right framing. Make sure all your your connection power connections are made. Your dew heaters are on. Your intervalometer is set and program. Um, and then you start taking your exposures. So my recommendation is you're probably not going to take a one 30 minute shot like you do with star trails. You're probably going to go to two to five minute maximum 10, but I would be much less than that because at 10 minutes, your tracking is going to be, you're going to start trailing a little bit, even with a 17 mil. So two to five minutes, probably around five minutes, ISO 800. So, uh, on an F2 lens or F4 maximum. If you stop it down, that'll give you enough speed there to get some good uh, contrast between the Milky Way and the background. It'll come out. Uh, anything outside of that, you may have a washed out view. Yeah, and and then take about, and that would take about uh, 20 to 30 exposures. Uh, and then you can stack them later on. I'm not going to get into the stacking software stuff of it but you can take those and then get those stacked and it should be fine and shoot all your frames in raw so stay away from uh, jpeg if you can if you can shoot raw and jpeg that's great but don't need to focus on raw um the other technique which is really neat um is time lapse and again i'm not going to get into that particular um technique but there are some really neat Master of photography done with time lapse uh, photography. We can probably that's a topic for another day, but it's uh, quite fascinating that way. So, um, anyways, any questions on on this? Actually, I have a question uh, about yes. the time lapse thing. I don't know what you mean by time lapse. Yeah, so you'll see some uh, photography that's done 
For example, you see the, the clouds moving across the sky in a very fast motion. You may see stars that rise up from the horizon and move across the sky within a few Okay, seconds. yes, I know what That's you mean. what I mean by, by time-lapse photography. And some, some actually, some cameras uh, and mounts have like push-button features for time-lapse. Uh, or some intervalometers will allow you to just set up a time-lapse mode and you stick it on, make sure you got everything powered up okay, and you walk away. And it'll take a shot every five minutes or so like that. And uh, it's not hard. And they'll actually put all those frames together and you have a timeline. So some cameras make it very easy to do. I don't have those features. Uh, so I have to do those manually uh, and then stitch them together. But there are a lot of cameras now will will, will do that. And uh, it's... It's great. You know, there was a guy at uh, NYA and he kind of runs the, he had for years in um, Andreas Gatta. He's a master of time, time-lapse photography. You ought to see some of his work. It's just outstanding. Uh, and it's really, it's really neat, but he'll spend, he'll spend uh, a week uh, doing a, um, like a 10 minute time-lapse video of his, what he wants to get. It's a lot of it doesn't it make it sound easy, but it's not that easy. A lot of things happen, right? So, any other questions on this? Okay, okay. So the next topic we're going to talk a bit about here is wide field deep sky region. So um, this is building upon the two other methods that I talked about before, but now we're going to start. Um, adjusting some of the settings on a camera and doing things a little bit different. Um, and this is where uh, some different techniques come in and also your ability to find objects in the sky are and frame things are harder. So, because a lot of stuff you won't be able to see. And so what do you do? We use the focus and the polar alignment techniques we talked about earlier. Uh, you're going to need a tracking mount of some kind that you used for the um, uh, Milky Way shots. All the, the equipment and setups and the connections are, are mostly the same that you have with, with the Milky Way shots. Now you're going to apply them to the deep sky region. And this is where the, your knowledge of the night sky comes in handy. Um, you can use that tool, Polar Scope Align Pro, um, and I've used that many times and it's very handy, but you kind of need to know where you're pointing in the sky and where these objects are. And so star charts, you know, uh, planetarium software, whatever, this is where the planning comes in handy. So before you go out to attempt this photography, you've actually sat down, you've looked at your star charts, your planetarium software, you know the marker stars. And then what you do is you draw a line around, you look at um, what kind of lens you're going to use uh, and the conditions of the sky and where you're going to be located and approximately where that's going to be in the sky. And you draw a box around that region that you want to photograph. And so that you have an idea of where you're going to frame or how you're going to frame your camera and rotate it and match those alignment stars in the field. I mean, you hopefully have a dark enough sky. Again, this you're you're talking now minimum board of four. Um, you go three, four for this kind of photography, maybe even you know, two is hard to get to, but three or four would be okay. So you're gonna have some marker stars. Do you wanna plan that out in advance? Wait until you get out there in the field and trying to manipulate and you're going to spend all night trying to find an object and focus and everything else. And, you know, you're not going to get there very easily. Uh, it's going to be a method of frustration. So, um, like the easiest way would be to just to draw a box around on a star trite or they're actually, um, I think Stellarium has it, but for sure Sky Safari has it. It's a really handy feature. And basically what you do is you can set up all your equipment in the app. So you can have your focal length, your lens, your tracking mount, your camera that you're using, 
It knows you can program it with the right chip size, everything, and it'll draw a box around your region of interest. And you can even rotate your camera and you can see the box and know where you're going to be. So that when you're out in the field, uh, you can align your frame as, as best as you can. Um, and that's gonna be key. Then the other techniques of the focus that using the batten off masks and all the other techniques are important. Polar, polar alignment is essential. You have to get as good a polar alignment as possible. Um, you're gonna be taking images, no less than two minutes, probably two to five minute exposures on a tracking mount. Um, ISO setting 800. And in this kind of photography, you will see a lot of people tell you that they push it beyond 1600, they go to 3200 or 6400. I haven't, I've yet to see a camera that does a really good job at those ISO rates and maybe some manufacturers tout that, but for photography where signal to noise ratio is really important. See what happens with, with most manufacturers, when you pump up the ISO, it, it amplifies the signal, but it can't discern between the signal and the noise. So it'll amplify the noise with the signal. So your signal to noise ratio really doesn't, um, it doesn't really improve the signal to noise ratio. There's an optimal amount, optimal amount, depending on the type of camera you have. My experience is most cameras around the ISO 800 is a good compromise between high speed and a really good signal to noise. Some cameras are better and they can go a bit higher. Uh, but I've used several different manufacturers and once you start getting into the really high ISO, I, I don't like the results. Uh, as soon as you start, and they look great, in their their um, you know in their um, natural view, but as soon as you start focusing in and magnifying that image, you can see green in that image, no matter what. So I would stick to that kind of ISO um, and a f4 or f2 to f4 lens, even if it's stopped down um, at ISO 800 on a two minute shot, you can get quite a bit. You can easily pick out things like the Ryan Lagoon Nebula. Uh, you can um, uh, you can pick even out the horse head um, from you know say a Bortle Three Sky, no problem. To get dust and outlying nebula like Barnard's Loop and the dust around this frame here, you're going to have to take. You're probably going to have to get two hours of exposures. So if you're taking two minutes, that's a lot of exposure. So you either increase your length a little bit, but um, it's best to take shorter exposures, not too short, but shorter exposures, but a lot of them. So it, it, it depends, again, it depends what you want to have come out. If you just want to get some basic nebula in there and stuff like that, a few minutes is going to do it. But if you really want to progress your skills, beyond that and get the dust lanes and everything else, uh, it's it's a lot more exposure. Keep in mind that the signal to noise ratio, um, in, it's a logarithmic scale. So in, in with, with astrophotography, in order to improve your image um, by a couple of dB in signal to noise, you have to quadruple the number of uh, uh, exposures. So, if you want to get, for example, a 10 minute shot made up of five two minute exposures, if you want to increase the signal to noise ratio, if you want to you know, double the, the, the signal to noise ratio, you have to take four times as many shots. So a lot of, you know, a lot of times you'll get out there and you'll take, a, and this is something that's really, someone asked in the first session, should I go for multiple images in a night? When you're dealing with deep sky region photography, you will focus on one object a night uh, because it just, to, to get that amount of signal to noise that you need, it takes a long time. Again, it depends on what you're photographing, but a photograph like this one here, which has some dust coming out in it, that's a minimum of two hours, more like four hours. So to get it all set up and do that, you're spending a whole night on one image. It's a lot of work, but it's uh, you know, at the end of the day, you get some pretty amazing results.
Um, with regards to uh, longer focal lengths, um, I would, in, when you're starting out with deep sky region, a good uh, lens to work with is 135 millimeter. It's a good compromise for anything less than that. And you're going to lose some detail. Again, it depends on what you're trying to photograph. If you want to get like Milky Way in with something else, that's fine. But now you're getting deep sky regions, which are, you know, a few mag, uh, you know, a bit of magnification there. You need something around 135 millimeters in, in terms of, uh, that's what I would recommend you, you go with a, a, as a starting point. Um, and then from there, <clears throat> uh, and then from there, you can work your way up, but it's a good starting point. Just see if I uh, missed anything. Yeah, questions, please. I have a, okay, this is a really basic question. So you talked about your example of 20 exposures at two minutes each. Is that the same as 40 exposures at one minute each? That was a really good, is it Paul? Yeah. Yeah, really good question. Um, not quite. Um, the, there is actually um, there's actually a math. There's a lot of math behind it, but it has to do with how signal to noise is calculated. And um, there's actually some calculators online where you can look at a signal to noise ratio based on the amount of exposures and you plug in different parameters and things like that. There's a lot of factors that are involved in calculating signal to noise ratio. But, you know, if you take a, a one minute, uh, there is a sweet zone and it depends on your background sky. So if you're in, uh, say a Bortle three sky or Bortle two sky, you can get away with, you know, five minute exposures with hardly any light pollution coming through and it's your signal to noise ratio uh, on those five minute exposures is going to be way higher than doing one minute and five exposures. Uh, and it's just the way it is. Now, if you're in a Bortle four sky or five sky, you may have to deal with one minute exposures and take a whole bunch of them. It'll work, but you're going to have to take a lot more. So it's not, it, it depends on your know, background conditions and, and what you what you can go for. It's not an easy answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> does that help? Like it, it like it does. Um, um, so the idea is to don't pick a whole bunch of one minute exposures. <laughs> you you can you can so so let's you know for example maybe we're shooting a comet or something like that and we're in Bortle Five Sky. Uh, one minute exposures might do very well uh, mm -hmm. and get pick up that comet uh, if you take enough of them. Um, but um, if I'm in a portal seven or eight sky and I try to do a say a two minute exposure on that comet or four minute exposure, all I'm going to do is pick up a bunch of noise from from sky pollution. So again, yeah. it depends on your conditions and, and things like that. You can get away with, and again, if your tracking is not, if you don't have a great tracking mount, then you might be forced to do one minute exposures and you can still do quite a bit. You just take more exposures, but it, it's not gonna be the same as taking one longer exposure and doing a bunch of those, right? It's not okay. a direct correlation, but you can still get great results for sure. Yeah. And in fact, when you're starting out, you probably want to stick to shorter exposures because it's it's easier to align um, and uh, it, it, it's, it, it does less taxing on all your equipment as well. So let's put it that way. Uh, by the way, longer exposures on certain cameras, the electronics heat up too much and you get more noise introduced. Now, some of the newer cameras uh, are less impacted by noise but now if you have a dedicated astrophotography camera, which is cool, then you don't have any issue at all. But some of the DSLRs, uh, some of the older ones suffered from heat buildup. So anything beyond like two, three minutes, you're getting a lot of noise. So it wasn't okay. even possible. Newer ones don't have that much of an issue anymore.
Yeah, so there's a lot, sorry, so many factors with this stuff. It's a lot of trial and error, you know, and every piece of equipment is different than another, but these are some general guidelines. Any other questions? Okay. How are we doing for time? Almost an hour, please. Okay, so I just wanna see if, yeah, well, this is the last chart, second last chart. So taking your first photographs, um, you know, what, before you go out to a dark sky, um, what I would recommend is you set up everything in your backyard or where you're going to do, set up your equipment, just like you're going to set it up when you get there and do some practice. Now you're probably not going to take photographs. You can try, but you're not going to get much because it's light polluted or whatever. Maybe it's indoors, but set it all up and make sure you have everything working. You don't want to wait till you go outdoors to, to do all that. Um, you want to become familiar with focusing techniques and polar alignment, and this takes time. Um, and you want to do this at home many times and do test photos and magnifying the stars to make sure you got it. Um, and then take your make a checklist. This is what I do. I make a checklist to make sure you do each step in the right order and proper. You have to have a lot of patience because you're going to be frustrated. Um, and uh, don't be discouraged if your fir fir uh, first few results don't work out the way you want them. It takes time to get it right. And, and uh, um, you know, it takes practice. It takes time. Uh, but when you do get it and you start getting results, it's extremely satisfying. It's, uh, um, it's something to behold. That's for sure. And the last chart here, this is uh, by Jake. I think he's on a call. So Jake, thank you for sending this in. Do you want to talk a bit about this photograph and what you did to get it? It's beautiful. I had to unmute myself. Um, it's at Killarney. Uh, you can see the observatory right there. And I wanted to capture that to get the observatory in. And then it was just the Milky Way was coming right out of it. So it was pretty cool. It is, it's a 20 second exposure and I did use a really high ISO just because I wanted to get that 20 second um, thing. That I, I, that was the max I can go. Like I've learned now that that's the max I can go without getting um, uh, trails. Yeah. yeah, so it was pretty cool. But um, the different, like with the Canon EOS 1DX, it's the Mark III, so its sensor is huge. Nice. So a lot of the noise, and, it's a professional camera because that's my profession. Yeah. So I know not everybody can have access to it. Um, so its sensor can handle the higher ISOs. Yeah. Uh, and also the uh, the signal to noise ratio is also a lot lower, but I just wanted to get everything. It's unfiltered. Uh, it's a little, I did a little Photoshopping to it um, just to enhance some of the dust colors. And I like, I've been learning that from uh, other from YouTubers, from astrophotographer YouTubers. And they tell you, it's like, if you want to bring out the dust, that's one of the only ways you're going to be doing it. But it's captured in raw and that really helps. So it brings it, brings out the thing. But like, I wanted to get the, like the, the, the observatory in there as well. And so- the, and I, I really like the fact there, and I talked about tracking mounts and all this time lap or, uh, you know, longer exposures, but this is on a tripod at 20 seconds. Exactly. With the right equipment, you can still get really decent results. You don't necessarily have to have a more expensive tracking mount and everything else if you have the right, you know, the the right kind of lens, I should say, and, and the right setup. In your case, you've got it tuned just right. And I'm astounded at what you could pick up on 20 seconds here. This is really Yeah, it, it was crazy. Yeah. Well, it was also in Killarney, right? So the sky yeah. was just like, Bortle two? It's Yeah, Bortle 2 or Bortle 1. I, I can't That's remember. You can get. Yeah. Jake. Did, Jake, did you add any light, like the light coming in from nope. the bottom left? No, that, so no, it just there was, was like, there. And... Yeah, everything was there from like coming, like where where if you guys have been there, like where where the where the where the observatory is, it's like it's a public thing, so that like they expect people to come through, right? Um, so there's light, there's a bit of light uh, from, oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm pointing to the picture uh, around. The trees and in the trees, there's a lot of buildings. It's like the, so, so the maintenance building is there. There's also like some of the the housing for some of the staff is there. 
So there's lights going on all over the place there, but, and the, that trail was lit up that way. We're oh, like cool. leading up to the observatory. Really cool. Just pointing and, it out. It's so neat. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I just, the, the, uh, and in, in here, in terms of the creativity here with the observatory, it just so happened you were aligned with, yeah. like, it's like yeah. a smoke trail coming up out of the observatory. It's exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, I wanted, I wanted to, like, I, I positioned myself like I was like, you know, walking in the dark, but I had my headlamp on a little bit so I can see a little bit. And I just positioned it so that I could get the Milky Way going straight up. And this nice. is like, my, this is only my third encounter with the Milky Way. The first time I, sh I saw it or photographed it was in um, uh, Torrance. Torrance, uh, okay. And it was just like, wow. <laughs> It blows you, you, it blows you away. Eye, just blowing yeah. Out, yeah. yeah, it blows you away when you can see it with the naked eye. Like you don't see the colors, obviously, like a lot of the colors, because that's comes in afterwards, as I learned when I was there and afterwards. So I, I, but, I um, what what kind of what tripod and tripod head do you use, Jake? Oh uh well I, so like I said, I am a professional, so I have a lot of different types okay. of tripod. For yeah. this one, it was probably um, an 055, a, a Manfrotto 055. 055, yeah. yeah, I got that. Yeah. Yeah, they're nice. Yeah, they're, they're, it's a good lightweight, lightweight. Uh, all around tripod that you yeah. can, and it's sturdy enough. To, it can handle like uh, up to 20 to 30 pounds. Right. On it, if you put the right head on it, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I have like I have various heads all over the place. I can't remember which head I put on it at this at this at that time, but yeah, it would have been sturdy. Cool. And, and I That's brought great. like, sorry, Alan. Yeah, go ahead. Oh no, and I I brought a lot of different tripods up there to try out and everything because I was there for a week, so it was a lot of fun. Yeah. No, and this was great. only the one clear night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It, isn't that the truth? I mean, you go. I mean, he, many times I've gone out and it's like you're there for at a place for three, four days or whatever, and you get one night. That's good. Yeah, one night. <laughs> and it's just like you just, you got to happen, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just got to, you got to like try to line up everything. Like, like everything. Starfest last year, right? Like, <laughs> that's unbelievable. Anyways, thanks, Jake, for for contributing that. I appreciate oh, it. My pleasure. Okay. Now, so that's it. That's all I had. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, are there any questions from anybody? Are we going to get to see some of your photos? I've sprinkled my photos already. I think I've a couple had a few in here, uh, okay. but uh, yes, you will see some more uh, photos probably in the next section, the next couple of sections. But I <laughs> most of the photos that are at the beginning of the presentations are my photos. So yeah, I'll point them out. <laughs> I wanted to. Yeah. Anyways, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, it's recorded, so we'll send the link out shortly on that. Uh, for those, I think some people couldn't attend, but I really appreciate the live audience here. Uh, and I'm hoping that this is helpful. Please uh, let me know what your thoughts are. If you have any questions, um, just send them my way. I'm more than happy to, uh, to respond and help out. Thanks everybody. Thanks very Thanks, much, Dennis. Dennis. Thanks, thank Dennis. you, Dennis.